All right, guys, we're starting a new book. This one's called Freedom to Choose by Milton Friedman, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize and his wife, Rose Friedman. I think it's his wife. <clears throat> I wasn't going to do this, but I guess I'm going to do the introduction. Introduction video. Mm, I already read through it. I'm not going to try to... Uh, Stop and decipher or ponder or discuss. So Milton Friedman, Friedman one of the most renowned economists uh, from America, lived in the 20th century. This is the introduction. Ever since the first settlement of Europeans in the New World, America, has been a magnet for people seeking adventure, fleeing from tyranny, or simply trying to make a better life for themselves and their children. An initial trickle swelled after the American Revolution and the establishment of the United States of America and became a flood in the 19th century when millions of people streamed across the Atlantic and a smaller number across the Pacific, driven by misery and tyranny and attracted by the promise of freedom and affluence. When they arrived, they did not find streets paved with gold. They did not find an easy life. They did not find freedom and an opportunity to make the most of their talents. Through hard work, ingenuity, thrift, and luck, most of them succeeded in realizing enough of their hopes and dreams to encourage friends and relatives to join them. The story of the United States is a story of an economic miracle and a political miracle. An economic miracle, okay, the story of the United States is the story of an economic miracle and a political miracle that was made possible by the translation into practice of two sets of ideas, both by a curious coincidence formulated in documents published in the same year, 1776. One set of ideas was embodied in the wealth of nations written by Adam Smith, who was a Scotsman, the masterpiece that established the Scotsman Adam Smith as the father of modern economics. It has analyzed the way in which a market system could combine the freedom of individuals to pursue their own objectives with the, ex with the extensive cooperation and collaboration needed in the economic field to produce our food, our clothing, our housing. So, His book or his ideas in that book, The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, it's huge. I started reading it, but I'm reading so many other books. As a father of modern economics, it analyzed the way in which a market system could combine the freedom of individuals to pursue their own objectives, their own self-interest. That's one of, he came up with that idea that if everybody looks out for their own self-interest, it's going to benefit everybody, i.e. the invisible hand. It'll, it'll come. It'll come. Freedom of individuals to pursue their own objectives with the extensive cooperation, that's important, and collaboration needed in the economic field to produce our food, our clothing, our housing. The, the Even, I think Plato spoke about this, the division of labor. The principle of specialization. You know, a plumber is a plumber. A plumber, back then, a plumber would trade his expertise with an electrician. Oh, you know, electrical, I know plumbing. It was a more efficient way to get things done. Because one man doing everything was impossible. So there was a division of labor. There was a, 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 a principle of specialization. I, I'm not sure if it was Plato. Um, I could be wrong right there. It's some, I just learned it recently. I think it wasn't Plato's Republic. Yeah, it wasn't Plato's Republic. That was his political philosophy. Um, and collaboration needed in the economic field to produce our food, our clothing, and our housing. Adam Smith's key insight was that both parties to an exchange can benefit in that so long as cooperation is strictly voluntary. Remember, remember that idea, the freedom of individuals. So long as cooperation is strictly voluntary, no exchange will take place. Unless 
parties do benefit. No external force, no coercion, like no strong government, no bully, no violation of freedom is necessary to produce cooperation among individuals, all of whom can benefit. That is why, as Adam Smith put it, an individual who intends only his own gain. It sounds selfish, but it's kind of how it's, it's been working so far. Adam Smith put it, an individual who intends only his own gain and is led by an invisible hand. It's theoretical, but it makes sense. Is led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. So it's like an unselfish way is led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention, nor is it always the worst for the society that it was no part of it. By pursuing his own interests, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. Like when he pursues his own interests, not just speaking about some selfish, I have never known much good done by those who affected to trade for the public good. <laughs> the second set of ideas was embodied in the Declaration of Independence drafted by Thomas Jefferson to express the general sense of his fellow countrymen. It proclaimed a new nation, the first in history established on the principle that every person is entitled to pursue his own values. In quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Or as stated in more extreme and unqualified form nearly a century later by John Stuart Mill. So he's quoting him. It's a, about a paragraph long. The sole end for which mankind are warranted individually or collectively in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. The only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. So he's, he's saying that's the only purpose of government is to prevent one person doing the harm to another. It's a little um, John Locke. Look up John Locke. He's a, he's a philosopher um, known for his political philosophy. He is, his own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. The only part of the conduct of anyone for which he is amenable to society is that which concerns others. This is definitely John Locke. Um, so it's not about he how he treats himself. The government should not be worried about how the person treats themselves. They should not be telling them what religion to follow, how they should rule their life. Um, it's just how it, the only part of the conduct of anyone for which is amenable, which is um, which needs to be corrected, um, is that which concerns others. In part, which merely concerns himself, his independence is of right absolute over himself, over his own body and mind. The individual is free. It says sovereign right here. I, I just made it say free. Much of the history of the United States revolves about the attempt to translate the principles of the Declaration of Independence into practice from the struggle over slavery, finally settled by a bloody civil war, to the subsequent attempt to promote equality of opportunity, to the more recent attempt to achieve equality of results. Hmm. Economic freedom is an essential requisite for political freedom. That's important right there. Economic freedom is an essential requisite for political freedom. By enabling people to cooperate with one another without coercion or central direction, i.e. central government, it reduces the area over which political power is exercised. In addition, by dispersing power, the free market provides an offset to whatever concentration of political power may arise. The combination of economic and political power in the same hands is a sure recipe for tyranny. The combination of economic and political power the combination of economic power and political power in the same hands is a sure recipe for tyranny. Remember, separation of powers in the Constitution was extremely important. Remember, they're, they're, these people are leaving a place they were unhappy from. They were not, not only that, so a lot of this was learned, you know. We're, we're lucky, we're lucky to be right here, man. The combination of economic and political freedom produced a golden age in both Great Britain and the United States in the 19th century. The United States prospered even more than Britain. It started with a clean slate. 
fewer vestiges of class and status, fewer government restraints, a more fertile field for energy, drive, and innovation, and an empty continent to conquer. The fecundity of freedom is demonstrated most dramatically and clearly in agriculture. When the Declaration of Independence was enacted, fewer than 3 million persons of European and African origin, i.e. omitting the Native Indians, occupied a narrow fringe along the eastern coast. When the Declaration of Independence was enacted, fewer than 3 million persons of European and African origin occupied a narrow furtive, or occupied a narrow fringe along the eastern coast. Agriculture was the main economic acti- agriculture was the main economic activity. It took 19 out of 20 workers to feed the country's inhabitants and provide a surplus for export in exchange for foreign goods. So he, I think he's saying like the amount of people that were in that area was not many, 3 million people of, of that whole area. So agriculture at that time was the main economic activity. Then it took 19 out of every 20 workers to feed the country's inhabitants and provide a surplus for export in exchange for foreign goods. Today it takes fewer than 1 out of 20 workers to feed 220 million inhabitants and provide a surplus that makes the United States the largest single exporter of food in the world. Remember, this is a while ago, so we're not sure where our place is, but we're still... Probably one of the most, I mean, we're still one of the most developed uh, parts of the world. What produced this miracle? Clearly not central direction by government. Nations like Russia and its satellites, mainland China, Yugoslavia, and India, that today rely on central direction, employ from one quarter to one half of their workers in agriculture. Yet frequently rely on U.S. agriculture to avoid mass starvation. During most of the period of rapid agriculture expansion in the United States, the government played a negligible role. Land was made available, but it was land that had been unproductive before. After the middle of the 19th century, land-grant colleges were established, and they disseminated information and technology through governmentally financed extension services. Unquestionably, however, the main source of the agricultural revolution was private initiative operating in a free market open to all. The shame of slavery only accepted. And the most rapid growth came after slavery was abolished. The millions of immigrants from all over the world were free to work for themselves as independent farmers or businessmen or to work for others. I'm going to highlight that's important right there. I, I did already. The most rapid growth came from after slavery was abolished. Think about that. All the other opportunities that came up. The millions, but then, you know, I still think about the black men and what opportunities were given him, you know. The millions of immigrants from all over the world were free to work for themselves as independent farmers or businessmen or to work for others at terms mutually agreed. Um, I'm sure there's still some farmers that, remember, we know this, that our neighboring countries, people would come over, live in these little trailers and send money back. You know, um, fruit pickers, you know, people that are agricultural pickers. They were free to experiment. They were free to experiment with new techniques. I think that was also what I, what I just said was a cause that when, when things reached full capacity, right? When he's speaking about the Industrial Revolution, all of a sudden people could come right away, right? Right away. You know, and what I'm speaking about was in my lifetime where migrants from Mexico would be bused over here at part of a program where they'll get money and they'll live here for a season and then go back or have to find other work. You know, that was more modern times, you know, like our our economy reached full capacity in the sense of opportunity, um, greater opportunity. Uh, the farmers or businessmen or to work for others at terms mutually agreed. They were free to experiment with new techniques at their risk if the experiment failed to their profit if it succeeded. They got little assistance from government. Even more important, they encountered little interference from government. Government started playing a major role in agriculture during and after the Great Depression of the 1930s. It acted primarily to restrict output in order to keep prices artificially high. Like to to not make to make things a little more scarce, because the more scarce, if if people demand something and there's not enough of it, that means it's more rare, so the price can be higher because there's more people willing to pay for that price. The growth of agriculture productivity depended on the accompanying industrial revolution that freedom stimulated. 
The growth of agricultural productivity depended on the accompanying industrial revolution that freedom stimulated. Thence came the new machines that revolutionized agriculture. Conversely, the industrial revolution depended on the availability of the manpower released by the agricultural revolution. Remember, urban cities started being created during this industrial revolution because people started working in working in factories now, no longer working mostly in the fields. So that, that transfer of manpower, it seemed to work, you know. The Industrial Revolution depended on the availability of the manpower released by the Agricultural Revolution. Industry and agriculture marched hand in hand. Smith and Jefferson alike had seen concentrated government power as a great danger to the ordinary man. They saw the protection of the citizen against the tyranny of government as a perpetual need. That was the aim of the Virginia Declaration of Rights and the United States Bill of Rights, which is 1 through 10 of the... the, the the amendments of the Constitution. The first ten amendments are the Bill of Rights. Just remember that. So when they say the Bill of Rights is just the first ten am amendments, and throughout these two past two hundred years, there's only been they've only added seventeen amendments. I think we're only on Amendment Twenty Seven now. The purpose of the separation of powers in the U.S. Constitution. Remember the uh, the aim of not having so much government, that was the aim of the Virginia Declaration of Rights and the United States Bill of Rights, 1776, the Bill of Rights, 1791, and the purpose of separation of powers in the U.S. Constitution. The moving force behind the changes in the British legal structure from the issuance of the Magna Carta in the 13th century to the end of the 19th century, to Smith and Jefferson, government's role was an umpire, not a participant. So the government's only there to... to you know, to protect us uh, militarily, uh, to protect us of uh, property rights. If somebody's trying to steal from you or somebody's trying to harm you, you know, they're not supposed to be a participant in these things. Jefferson's ideal, as he expressed it in his first inaugural address, 1801, was a wise and frugal government which shall restrain men from injuring one another, which shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement. Ironically, the very success of economic and political freedom reduced its appeal to later thinkers. See, this this is right now. Ironically, the very success of economic and political freedom reduced its appeal to later thinkers. The narrowly limited government of the late 19th century possessed little concentrated power that endangered the ordinary man. The narrowly limited government of the 19th century late 1800s, possessed little concentrated power that endangered the ordinary man. The other side of that coin was that it possessed little power that would enable good people to do good. And in, and in an imperfect world, there were still many evils. Indeed, the very progress of society made the residual evils seem all the more objectionable. As always, people took the favorable developments for granted. They forgot the danger to freedom from a strong government. Instead, they were attracted by the good that a stronger government could achieve if only government power were in the right hands. These ideas began to influence government policy in Great Britain by the beginning of the 20th century. So in early 1900s, Britain, remember, capitalism not really that new. So the ideas began to influence, so he's talking about people who were against capitalism. That's what he was saying the last couple couple like last minute i was reading they were attracted by the good that a strong government would achieve everybody everything's equal for everybody but it has to be in the right hands these ideas began to influence government policy in great britain by the beginning of the 20th century they gained increasing acceptance among intellectuals in the united states but had little effect on government policy until the great depression of the early 1930s as we show in chapter three the depression was produced by a failure of government in one area money, where it had exercised authority ever since the beginning of the Republic. However, government's responsibility for the Depression was not recognized either then or now. Instead, the Depression was widely interpreted as a failure of the free market capitalism. That myth led the public to join the intellectuals in a changed view of the relative responsibilities of individuals and government. Emphasis, remember that, that word relative, for those of you who are in, 
educating themselves that's an important word relative you hear it like in economy you heard it in a lot remember we're dealing with people here so a lot of things are, are are overlapping all these disciplines of science economy there's math math is just a tool for these things so science economy philosophy psychology relative that means like whatever you, it, it relates to you Relative responsibilities of individuals and government. Emphasis on the responsibility of the individual for his own fate was replaced by emphasis on the individual as a pawn, buffeted by forces beyond his control. So he's saying the idea where we used to think the responsibility of the individual as for his own fate was replaced by no, that's just, that's a lie. It's really the individual as a pawn buffeted by forces beyond his control. The view that government's role is to serve as an umpire to prevent individuals from coercing one another was replaced by the view that government's role is to serve as a parent charged with the duty of coercing some to aid others. These views have dominated developments in the United States during the past half century. They have led to a growth in government at all levels as well as to a transfer of power from local government and local control to central government and central control. The government has increasingly undertaken the task. The government has increasingly undertaken the task of taking from some to give to others in the name of security and equality. They're wiping away competition. One government policy after another has been set up to regulate our pursuits of industry and improvement. Standing Jefferson's dictum on its head. These developments have been produced by good intentions with a major assist from self-interest. He's talking about the, some people who are in control politically. They, 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 there's good intentions. You, you're feeding all these people struggling, good intentions, but really there's always there's someone who's implementing this. Is there really people in the street doing it? Do we see it? Is it observable? Is it is it anecdotal? Do you do you, do you have any any stories to tell of what you've seen? Have you seen people really have central control? Is there really a group of people and nobody leading it? Everybody can read each other's mind and just know. Nope. Slap their hand once they try to get something. No, no, nope. Wait your turn. Wait, wait, wait. Even the strongest supporters of the welfare and paternal state agree that the results have been disappointing. In the government sphere, as in the market, there seems to be an invisible hand, but it operates in precisely the op opposite direction from Adam Smith's. An individual who intends only to serve the public interest by fostering government intervention is led by an invisible hand to promote private interest, which was no part of his intention. That conclusion is driven home again and again as we examine in the chapters that follow the several areas in which government power has been exercised, whether to achieve security or equality, to promote education, to protect the consumer or the worker, or to avoid inflation and promote employment. So far, in Adam Smith's words, the uniform, constant, and uninterrupted effort of every man to better his condition, the principle from which public and national, as well as private opulence is originally derived, has been powerful enough to maintain the natural progress of things toward improvement in spite both of the extravagance of governments and, a, and of the greatest errors of administration. Like the unknown principle of animal life, it frequently restores health and vigor to the constitution in spite not only of the disease but of the absurd prescriptions of the doctor. <laughs> So far, that is, Adam Smith's invisible hand has been powerful enough to overcome the deadening effects of the invisible hand that operates in the political sphere. Remember, like, I just kind of painted a, a, a picture that I'm a little uh, surprised at the way I, way I came up with that, but that just happens naturally. The idea that, so where is this, where is this going on? The same way that government's working, there's always going to be a government. But is it of their self-interest when they're saying that's good for everybody? Nope, nope, nope. I don't know. I, I... Either we have no fucking borders. Let's not pretend like we have borders. Let's not pretend we have borders and just not have borders. Because I'm thinking about this too. I'm trying to be in the fucking middle. I'm trying to balance it all out. Like we have to come do something. Like do we keep this game within America and not let nobody come in here and play? But because they're, they're trying to keep labor down, the same people, the same capitalists who, who, who want good for themselves, they also want to hire cheaper people too. So there's a paradox. There's a mind fuck. There's I see both sides. I see I see the I see it. I see. It. Shout out to my homie German because you think about him when I, 
is it Hermann? But I call him German because it's spelled that way. I, I um, I think that's how he, his 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 name is literally German. That's an awesome name, actually. Think about it. I'm pretty sure it derives from the country. You know, check this out. So, I see argue. <laughs> I see imperfection on both sides. I see good on all sides. You know, but also, I'm a countryman. I also want my people here to not be forgotten and swept aside by the considerable like you're trying to keep wages down so you just bring in more immigrants and say fuck the fuck the generations fuck the american generations that have been established here you know that's my argument where did i leave off at um the experience of recent years slowly Oh no, the experience of recent years slowing growth and declining productivity raises a doubt whether private ingenuity can continue to overcome the deadening effects of government control if we continue to grant ever more power to government to, uh, to authorize a new class of civil servants to spend ever larger fractions of our income supposedly on our behalf. If we continue to grant ever more power to government to authorize a new class of civil servants to spend ever larger fractions of our income supposedly on our behalf, sooner or later and perhaps sooner than many of us expect, an even bigger government would destroy both the prosperity that we owe to the free market and the human freedom proclaimed so eloquently in the Declaration of Independence. We have not yet reached the point of no return. We are still free as a people to choose whether we shall continue speeding down the road to serfdom, as Frederick Hayek entitled his profound and influential book, or whether we shall set tighter limits on government and rely more heavily on voluntary cooperation among free individuals to achieve our several objectives. Will our golden age come to an end in a relapse into the tyranny and misery that has always been and remains today the state of most of mankind? Or shall we have the wisdom, the foresight, and the courage to change our course, to learn from experience, and to benefit from a rebirth of freedom? Remember, this book was written in, this, in like the late 60s. If we are to make that choice wisely, we must understand the fundamental principles of our system, both the economic principles of Adam Smith, which explain how it is that a complex, organized, smoothly running system can develop and flourish without central direction. How coordination can be achieved without coercion. And the political principles expressed by Thomas Jefferson, we must understand why it is that attempts to replace cooperation by central direction are capable of doing so much harm. We must understand also the intimate connection between political freedom and economic freedom. Fortunately, the tide is turning. In the United States and Great Britain, the countries of Western Europe, and in many other countries around the world, there is growing recognition of the dangers of big government, growing dissatisfaction with the policies that have been followed. This shift is being reflected not only in opinion, but also in the political sphere. It is becoming politically profitable for our representatives to sing a different tune and perhaps even to act differently. We are experiencing another major change in public opinion. We have the opportunity to nudge the change in opinion toward greater reliance on individual initiative and voluntary cooperation rather than toward the other extreme of total collectivism. In our final chapter, we explore why it is that in a supposedly democratic political system, special interests prevail over the general interest. We explore that we can do we, ex we explore what we can do to correct the defect in our system that accounts for that result, how we can limit government while enabling it to perform its essential functions of defending the nation from foreign enemies, protecting each of us from coercion by our fellow citizens, adjudicating our disputes, and enabling us to agree on the rules that we shall follow.